What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Natalie Brunel is the host of the Coin Stories podcast. She's a media commentator, host of the brand new hard money show, investor, educator, and writer. Natalie is also an Emmy award-winning journalist and one of the most articulate and informed speakers on macroeconomics, finance, and Bitcoin that you will hear in media. Natalie Brunel, welcome to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you? Oh, thank you so much for having me and for those kind words. I really, really appreciate it. Sure. Well, I'm super excited to uh, chat. Uh, I do find that uh, you have a way of uh, being very articulate and eloquent about uh, current events, what's happening. And uh, I would love to hear uh, about first about your new show, Hard Money. I did catch uh, the one with Michael Saylor and it was phenomenal. And so I'd love to hear how that came together. Yeah, sure. So thank you so much again. Um, you know, my, my background is media and journalism. I was a television broadcast news correspondent and investigative reporter and anchor for about a decade. And I'm basically applying that skill set to the world of Bitcoin, which is the thing I'm most passionate about, because I think that Bitcoin could potentially address so many of the of the biggest problems that we face um, in this country and in, and around the world. Um, but the Hard Money Show is a weekly Bitcoin headline driven news show. It's a video program uh, about 30 minutes long that has a mix of news topics and information about what's happening in both Bitcoin and the global economy, as well as uh, an interview each week and original stories, original reports, um, and uh, and a macro segment from, from Andy Edstrom. So I'm really excited about it. It's produced by Swan Bitcoin, as well as Bitcoin Magazine, and just really proud of the, the work that the team has been doing on it. Yeah, the show's awesome. So uh, I know some of the people behind it, Swan and Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, I know that you were the host of the main stage at Bitcoin 2022, uh, the largest Bitcoin conference in history. So uh, tell us what your experiences were like at Bitcoin 2021 and, and how they compared to your experience at Bitcoin 2022. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that it's a world of difference, and it's kind of amazing what can change in a year. And I hope that people in your audience find this to be somewhat inspiring if they have something that they're passionate about and maybe thinking or ruminating on. Um, so I went to the Bitcoin 2021 conference last year. It was held in June in Miami, and I had been collecting interviews for my podcast. And I was just, again, I was super passionate about Bitcoin. I was hoping to learn more about it through some of the most prominent names in the space. And if you listening to my show, you know that I, I get into kind of the origin stories because I've always been fascinated with people's backgrounds and biographies, autobiographies. And I've always loved stories of, you know, people overcoming obstacles and rags to riches stories um, because I, I don't come from financial means. And I always found those stories to be, you know, just really interesting. And so I wanted to know, like, why do people have conviction for Bitcoin? Why do these big names believe in it? Why, how did they discover it? Um, and their reaction to some of the things happening in, in the headlines and news. Uh, so I brought a couple of episodes that I was, you know, ready to post. Uh, I posted them right, right. As the conference was starting, um, I dropped like, I don't know, I think four or five episodes that I had recorded and people were really, um, welcoming to both the idea for the show, as well as to me, you know, there aren't a ton of women in the space. So I think that kind of helped. There aren't a lot of female voices, but really it just organically grew and, um, the audience grew. And so you know, at the conference, I was actually using it to network. I was telling people about my show and handing out these little business cards with the QR code to say, hey, this show exists if you want to hear about these people's backstories. Um, and then I would literally, you know, go backstage. I got a media pass and I would walk up to people like Michael Saylor and I, I went to Saifedean's carnivore dinner and I would just, I would just, you know, be very persistent and just say, please, can you come on my show? This is who I am. This is what I do. And I got people to say yes, <laughs> as the result of just meeting them in person and showing them I'm a human being. Um, so a year later, incredibly Bitcoin, the podcast is now my full-time career. I, I left media, corporate media in October. So about six months or so after I started the show, 
Uh, I still can't believe that I, I've been able to, you know, monetize my show and, and have it become my career. Um, but I think it goes to show that when you're passionate about something, you believe in it and you've put in the work and you've gain the knowledge to share it, you know, things can happen. Um, and so this year, yes, I anchored the main, like little main stage area that was the news aspect for the conference. I got to MC on the main stage and I'm just so humbled again and grateful because all I want to do is help people understand what Bitcoin is, get people kind of onboarded and comfortable and sort of simplify the message. Because when I learned about Bitcoin, it was so complicated and I didn't get it and I passed over it. And I wish someone had tapped me on the shoulder back then and been like, no, just take the time to learn about this. And so that's what I hope to offer people. So, yeah. Uh, speaking of origin stories, uh, where did you grow up and what kind of, uh, how did you get involved in journalism? Did you always want to be a journalist? Yeah. So uh, I'm a first generation immigrant. Uh, my family is from Poland. I was there until I was five years old. So I don't, I don't remember too much about my life there, but um my parents wanted to come to the US for the American dream. They grew up under communism um, and they just always felt like there was a very little social mobility and, and economic opportunity. So they wanted to come to the US. It took them a very long time to be able to come over because you know, getting a visa or that whole lottery system, it's very, very challenging um, and takes a very long time. So when we came, I really saw them just work so hard as immigrants here in the U S and, um, like I said, I mean, we, I don't come from a financially secure background and my parents worked multiple jobs. My dad would wake up at, you know, three o'clock in the morning to de-ice his car. Cause we were in the suburbs of Chicago where it was freezing. We had no garage. And like my, my dad worked from dawn until night. And, um, and that instilled in me a really strong work ethic. And we always had the news on at home because um, mm. it would help, you know, my parents learn English. It would augment their English skills. And, uh, and we were always just really into current events and information. So, uh, so we, I grew up watching news. I watched Oprah and Barbara Walters and Diane Sawyer. And I, I aspired to be that. I thought it was such a noble profession. I thought, you know, wow, it, you know, these people get to interview amazing thought leaders and prominent figures. And I just thought it would be an incredible, incredible career. So I, I always knew I wanted to do something in media, which was not what my parents wanted at all. They wanted me to become a doctor or a lawyer because that would be more, you know, financially stable of a career path. But I, my heart just told me I had to do something in media. So I pursued that, you know, in I got, I actually got an undergrad and graduate degree in journalism and communication. So, um, yeah, I, I just always wanted to make them proud and I hope I am. <laughs> uh, I'm sure you are. How, how are you, how do you deal with the travel and not just in terms of maybe going to the local news story, but it seems like you've had to move a lot over your career, whether it's to go to a different station or a different yeah. opportunity. Uh, has that been exciting? Is that is that sort of a, a drag? Is it a combination? It's it's definitely uh, it's definitely difficult. Yeah, I I think it got more difficult the older I got in my twenties. You know, you you sort of are just flying by the seat of your pants, and you're willing to live on no money and and just kind of have that lifestyle to pursue your dream. Um, but you know, a couple thing a couple things to share on that. My industry has really changed since when I pursued it and first wanted to get into it. You know, everyone used to watch TV news and you used to have a kind of appointment news viewing uh, at night and the ratings were really great. And it was a much more lucrative career as opposed to by the time I graduated from college, the internet was coming up and, and news stations were competing for ad dollars and sort of starting to, um, you know, buy each other, like the big stations would buy up the little ones. And it was just, it wasn't the same um, career path at all. And you, you went from doing, you went from having like a crew of five people to being a one woman or one man band and doing it all yourself for much less money. So, uh, so people don't really realize that it's not, it's not a super glamorous job. Um, and it does require you to move. So you start in a small town and I moved, um, in my twenties, I moved from, let's see, I went from Chicago to Malibu for undergrad. I spent two years, two, four semesters in Italy, then I went, I moved to LA. Then I moved to Chicago for grad school, finished grad school in DC, moved back to LA, went from LA to Palm Springs, Palm Springs to Sacramento, Sacramento back to LA. Wow. <laughs> so I have moved a lot and I've also traveled for assignments and it can get exhausting, but you know, I, I was pursuing a dream. And I think because of the 
Um, I don't know if this is going to make sense, but I think the thing that's always pushed me and allowed me to have the energy and to keep going and just overcome the obstacles is I felt like my parents sacrificed so much for me to be here and to have a chance at the American dream. And I want to justify their sacrifice. I want to do whatever I can so that their sacrifice is not lost. And I want to financially take care of them someday. And that's what drives me. So that's what gets me up in the morning. (laughs) Sure. I think that's a great reason to get up in the morning. Uh, I, I, I'd love to ask you what makes a good interviewer and a good good listener. (laughs) I think, I think when we're first starting out and I've had the chance to to teach journalism now, which I love uh, at USC. Um, the biggest thing is when you're starting out in this industry or, you know, or maybe you're trying to transition and anyone can be a journalist today. You can start a podcast, you can, you know, have your own YouTube show, but I think a lot of people plan a lot and like write things out and like they're very um, rigid in where they want things to go as opposed to just being an active listener and seeing where the conversation goes. And the best way to be able to do that is to be really, really prepared. So all of my preparation kind of happens before so that I'm not sitting there with a piece of paper with like every single question lined up that I can actually listen to the answers and take it to organic places, knowing that I have sort of the context and the background and the research already embedded in here um, and let the conversation go where where um, where it's going to go. Uh, and that's been kind of, that, that took me a bit to, to be able to do that. Cause when you start out, you're kind of like, Oh, I have to ask these questions and this is the order I'm going to put it in. And, right. and, and sometimes that like works against you. I guess in, in terms of that, how much do you think about the order of, I know you don't have maybe prepared questions, but you might have sort of topics or aspects of their life or, or work that you want to cover. And how do you manage maybe what they talk about, how long they might talk about something and maybe how to get the conversation going in the beginning if, if, you, if you do want it to be organic. Yeah, I definitely, if I have a new guest, I always start at the very beginning because I just am fascinated by those stories again. And I hope that people have gotten value out of it or you know, it's, it's quenched some sort of curiosity that they've had about some of my guests. Um, but yeah, after that, I kind of let the conversation go where it's going to go, um, based on their responses. And I'm definitely someone who does not cut people off. Like, I think that there are a lot of media figures who can like, they jump in or they want to jump in. Um, but I really like to just let people finish their whole statement, even if it's tangents and long ones, um, which, you know, sometimes people do go a little long and it maybe winds down a path that, you, mm-hmm. that gets a little, you know, in the weeds or boring, but I just, I like when people have the stage to talk, uh, and, and I, I want to offer that to them. So, so yeah. that's what I've done in my That's show. awesome. I think that's one of the things that makes podcasting great in that long form format. Yeah. Uh, what is your Bitcoin rabbit hole story? How did you find Bitcoin? Mm-hmm. So I was a reporter up in uh, the California State Capitol in 2017. I was covering everything. I was doing a lot of breaking news, uh, fires and state policy and, and investigative, a little bit of everything. Uh, and I had made uh, really good friends in San Francisco. So I went to San Francisco a lot. So I was kind of um, introduced to that whole Silicon, Silicon Valley world and lifestyle. And some of the people that I met had, they talked about crypto. One of them worked at Coinbase. Um, someone lost money on Mt. Gox, uh, another, you know, they were just, they were talking about Bitcoin. It was the first time I ever heard about it. And I just didn't get it. I, I, you know, I thought about it as kind of a stock or some, some digital, you know, good that could be hacked and could um, potentially go to zero. I just, I didn't understand anything about it. And I was extremely skeptical, like so many people probably in my audience as they come in are when they start their journey. Uh, I pitched a story about Bitcoin for my station in Sacramento, and they allowed me to do one. It was about a Bitcoin ATM. And this was during the time when Bitcoin ran from, you know, three, four thousand dollars all the way up to 20 <laughs> and then crashed. Mm. Uh, so I did one story and I and I bought Bitcoin during that time. I, I even though I was really skeptical about it, I guess I was enough of a risk taker or brave enough to just be like, you know what, I'm going to put some money on it. Like, and I think at the time my mentality was. Silicon, Silicon Valley seems to be, you know, 
always on the cutting edge of trends and where technology is going. They always seem to be first and the people that work in the space seem to be first. And, you know, these companies get bought up and go public and this and that. And so I thought, well, the, these people are probably smarter than me. So I want to get in on a little bit of it, but I just, again, I didn't understand it. And then I told a mentor of mine uh, who I'm very, very close with from my industry. I said, Hey, I bought this thing called Bitcoin. And he went on Amazon and typed in Bitcoin. And the first book that came up was the Bitcoin standard. So he read the Bitcoin standard and kept saying to me for, I, I'm telling you like a year or more, he kept going, you need to read this book. You don't know what you just bought. you like, this is incredible. You need to read the book. You need to read the book. And you know what happens in all of our lives. I was busy. I was working. I was this, I was moving. I'm like, I don't want to read a book about computer science and programming. I don't even know what this thing is. I have a little bit, like, I don't need to read this book. And he goes, please read this book. Well, I finally read the book and I regret not reading it sooner because the second that I had I had an aha moment during that book, which is why I am such, uh, I'm so grateful to Saifedean because I feel like he ultimately was one of the reasons why I pivoted careers and started my show and all of that. I read it and I was like, oh my gosh, this is why so many of the problems I've been reporting on for 10 years exist. Like it was that big of a thing. I mean, you have to understand, I, I spent the last 10 years, every single day interviewing people in different communities, in different towns, with different crises that all somehow kind of connect to money and the economy and people feeling left behind and things becoming more unaffordable and politicians coming in and blaming each other and saying, "We're I'm gonna spend this amount of money and city council meetings. I mean, it all boiled down to so many of the same problems. And it was the same thing that my own family experienced. We, we lost everything in the financial crisis of 08, 09. We lost our house. We were one of the 10 million Americans who went under. Um, and I finally got it. And I had never learned any of this. I had never learned about the history of the Federal Reserve, what money printing is, if there were other th economic theories on inflation. And so it was a huge pivotal moment for me. That book changed me. I went down the rabbit hole. I started to consume everything I could. Every podcast followed everybody on Twitter every book I could get my hands on about economics, started reading textbooks like macroeconomic textbooks and really spent about two years, like educating myself. Wow. And what has that journey been like maybe for your friends and family? Is this been a personal journey or do you try to involve your friends and family a lot? And how do you deal with uh, maybe people in your life not coming along for the ride as quickly as, as if you've gone? Yeah, I mean, I encourage all of the people close to me to read the Bitcoin standard as well as uh, the other books that are in the space and to, you know, jump on board to, to understanding this technology. And some have and some haven't. It's been a little bit of a, a mix. I'll be honest. I did. I was successfully able to orange pill my, my parents. Unfortunately, I managed to finally orange pill them when the price was much higher. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, I, I try to share Bitcoin with everybody. Certainly I start with the people around me, uh, my girlfriends, my family members, and then I've branched out from there to the people that are just following me and in my community and whoever I can reach. But, um, but yeah, it's been a little bit of a hit, a hit or miss and I get it because it took me years to get it. It took me years to finally read the book. So I try to be as patient as I can with people. Um, and I just, I, you know, it's, I feel like this is, this is my mission now is to try to help people understand. And I just had my best girlfriend in town from Chicago and, you know, we went to lunch the other day and I just said, you know, ask, like, ask me any question. Let's just spend the next hour. Just whatever you want to know about Bitcoin, let me ask you, or let me answer it. And she, uh, she asked a bunch of questions and then she finally decided to buy her first amount of sats. Um, but sometimes it just takes that conversation across the table or on zoom or whatever it might be. But you know, one person's journey takes one hour. Another person's journey takes years. <laughs> so right. we'll see. Yeah. Uh, I, I really love to kind of ask you about this current market sell-off and this current macro environment and what do you make of it? Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to be honest, I was always expecting there to be a, a crash, if not a massive deflationary bust. It's something that I've talked about with some of my guests, um, some guests that aren't even into, into Bitcoin, including Peter Schiff, as well as um, a macro strategist named David Hunter. We've had some thoughtful conversations about, hey, this is actually careening toward a cliff. What I will say is I thought that Bitcoin's price would have gone higher before that crash 
happens. So, you know, maybe we see like the six figures or, 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 or maybe like 100, 150, and then it crashes down to a support level of 50. I did not, what I did not foresee is it coming down right now from what didn't feel ever like a blow off top, you know, uh, in, in a bull market to, to this level of, you know, 17, I think was the lowest we've gotten so far and it could go lower. Um, but I always predicted that something would happen because we've, um, we've entered so much liquidity and so many dollars into the system that all of that money has been sloshing around in what else equities, crypto. And now that they're raising interest rates and making it more difficult and to service debt, of course, it's going to unwind and it's going to, um, I think bleed from every aspect of the financial markets. You know, a lot of focus sometimes is on Bitcoin, but Number one, there have been stocks that have performed worse than Bitcoin, including some really prominent ones that are down much harder and faster and further than Bitcoin. Bitcoin has, you know, suffered 80%, 90% losses in previous bear markets, and we're not there yet, but I think we could get closer there. And the second thing I want to say, one of the reasons why we could get there is because now we have all of these cross-collateralized tokens and cryptos and platforms that basically have to sell their Bitcoin when they have liquidity and solvency issues. And we see everything start to drain. And I think it's a really painful lesson. I mean, I know people who have their money stuck on Voyager right now and they can't get it out and they probably lost it. And that's really sad. Um, and I have people that I've saved. Like I have people where I said, get this money off. What if, what if, what if what happened to Celsius happens to this and you can't get your money and they took it off finally into cold storage. You know, it's just, these are the types of things that unfortunately are going to be painful lessons where people actually could lose their life savings, but at the same time, will cleanse the system because there is no bailout. There is no, there's no one that's going to swoop in and say, you know, unlike they did in 08, 09 and just start printing money to save the crypto companies that doesn't exist right. in this space. It's still highly unregulated, you know, highly speculative. And it really um, ballooned a lot during this quantitative easing and printing. So I just urge people to be very careful. Uh, I think it's going to be really choppy and volatile in the near term. I think that Bitcoin's price could go lower. I think we could face more solvency issues with companies. Um, I think that they're going to continue to try to be as aggressive as they can without sparking a real credit unwind and liquidity crisis on a global scale. Uh, you know, I think that it's it's been interesting to see earlier this year, countries admitting that they're de-dollarizing and they're kind of acknowledging that the U.S has printed so much money and gone so far into debt that they don't want to hold treasuries anymore. Like there's so many macro things that are coming to a head as this, as this long debt cycle comes to an end. And so I just, I urge people caution, but I don't change my long-term views at all. Um, I think this is a good accumulation point, entry point. Um, I'm definitely still cautious and waiting to see how much lower it gets, but I do not think that Bitcoin is dead. I do not think it's going to zero. I do still think it's going to, you know, solve a lot of the problems that I believe are are so rooted in in society today and have polarized us and pulled us apart so much. And uh, and I think that we just need to see what happens with the with the Fed and with interest rates and bonds over the next couple of months. Yeah. What are, what are the kind of things that you think might happen there in the broader economy with interest rates and gas prices and inflation? Yeah, I mean, well, obviously, inflation is the number one concern for Americans. I've seen all these polls and um, you know statistics where that's that's what everybody is concerned about: inflation, price of gas, price of groceries, and rightfully so. So, how do we tackle that? Well, they have to destroy, de destroy demand. They have to try to uh, hike interest rates, but not to a point where the government can't service its debt. Um, and and I think we just we have to remember all of this is just so many. We live in a manipulated, coerced fiat economy um, that's ruled by the few who have all the power. And I, I want to have an insurance policy against it because they have printed so much money and gone so far into debt that at this point, we are just kicking the can down the road. And Jeff Booth, I think, is one of the most thoughtful thinkers on this in the space where his book, The Price of Tomorrow, talks about this debt bubble and debt cycle that we have uh, created ourselves and policymakers have created, probably with some good intentions, um, probably also for a lack of knowledge in real economics. But we have these asset bubbles and all the money is flowing into real estate and equities. And that's people's savings accounts today. And the average person and the middle class and the worker, the labor class gets totally crushed and most
most of them don't save, don't have equities and don't, you know, they can't afford to be landlords. And so it's really having an impact on day-to-day -day life. And so I, I don't know how much more they'll be able to hike and when something's going to break in the system, so to speak. Um, but I think that that will come in the next three to six months and there will have to be a pivot because unfortunately, once things start to unwind and we're on the brink of a deflationary bust or, or you know, worse than a recession, a depression, they're going to have to turn around. And the level of printing that will take to get us out of that kind of unwind is going to be even more unprecedented than we've already seen. Uh, so again, like having an insurance policy against that is, is I think really, really important. And whether you want to allocate 1% to 5% to, you know, some people have more than 50% of their life savings in something like Bitcoin, that's a personal choice, but I certainly think that a 0% allocation is not the right one at this point. Right. How do you think you frame up Bitcoin to maybe a, a family who doesn't have a lot of savings yeah. and, uh, and is not using a lot of the financial tools and monetary instruments you, we, 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 that might be available to people. Well, how would you frame up Bitcoin? Yeah, so uh, I think it's really important to discuss and spread the idea of saving again. I think that in our country, we have normalized and glamorized consumer debt and just going into debt and everything going on credit cards and taking out mortgages and just sort of, again, like kicking the can down the road and taking on liabilities that you may or may not be able to, to pay off. My, the reason I'm really passionate about Bitcoin is the idea that it can return us to an economy of saving, an economy of something based on value. Uh, so even if you have very little money and very little means, which I know many, many people in that situation, and I've been in that situation, you can still put away something, right? Like there's still $5 that you can put away, $10 that you can put away. There's still always something that you can save. And today we do live in a, in a world where most people can't afford like a $400 emergency. I've seen stories. And I think I've reported at news stations where we've shared statistics like that. It is so important to start to pivot your behavior into one where every paycheck or every time you make something or maybe getting a second job, some, some, something on the side, you have to start putting away into savings. You, you just, you have to, because we cannot be a, a, a country with a productive economy when we're all just in debt, including our government more so than, you know, any of us. Uh, so I would encourage a family that is, um, you know, living paycheck to paycheck to still try to find a way to allocate something toward what is, in my opinion, one of the best savings technologies that's ever been invented that can never be manipulated, inflated, can't be confiscated from you, cannot be seized, cannot be revoked, um, and to hold it, you know, safe, keep it because obviously with platforms, you, you're trusting a third party. Um, and, and I think it's really important now more than ever, because we do see these issues with government control and inflation and, um, and really an economy that seems to be unwinding uh, at the, at the, you know, at the fringe in every sector. So, um, yeah, I think even if you have very little, you can still try to save something. And the way that I believe that people should try to save is obviously Bitcoin. Right. And so maybe for people of any age, uh, I get what you're saying, but what, what's this Luna stuff? What's this DeFi stuff? Uh, <laughs> how would you explain uh, to them what that is and maybe what some of the risks are there? Yeah, you know, this is a very early ecosystem. It's a very new industry, crypto at large. I'm very skeptical about crypto. I always try to, in my media appearances, separate this idea of Bitcoin versus crypto. Uh, this isn't the best comparison, but it's one that makes sense for me. It, I think about Bitcoin as the internet, right? And and the internet ha is, is decentralized. It has no headquarters. It has no CEO. It has no, no one that benefits from it more than another person based on where they are. You can't shut it down or kill it all over the world at the same time. Whereas I kind of see all these other <laughs> excuse me, crypto projects, tokens, cryptocurrencies as websites. Um, you know, some of them will succeed, some of them will fail, but you kind of have to bank on whoever's building them, uh, they're back, who they're backed by, you know, at what point do they 
um, exit and, and take and take profits for themselves, it's inherently more risky. And that goes to that conversation of something being digital property or digital commodity and truly decentralized versus being a security and worrying about, you know, who runs it, what the ICO is, um, who's going to potentially benefit from it. Uh, so that's how I, I kind of want people to think about it in terms of, you know, Bitcoin's one thing, but all these other projects, some of them may, may take off. I'm not saying that there's going to be a world where there are no other digital assets, but Bitcoin, um, but Bitcoin is the only one that is programmatically sound hard money and has the potential to be a global reserve currency and has the potential to fix some of the problems that lay at the foundation of our global economy, whereas the others um, may serve other purposes. And uh, and again, I, I think inherently carry more risk and are more centralized and more prone to, to do failure. Um, and, and, I, and I believe in free markets. So if you want to invest in that space, that is your prerogative. I just choose to really focus on Bitcoin. Right. And back to the kind of broader economy, I wonder which camp you're in. I tussle here whether the economy is headed for a cliff mm -hmm. or this is we've kind of passed maybe the 2008 moment and maybe 2020 was the 2008 moment. And even though we might have 8, 10, 12 percent inflation for two, three years, that's sort of normalized. Uh, things keep going the way they are the way it as is and, and people don't really get a, a huge sort of wake up call. See, I, I think that we're sort of um, at the, we're at a point where I think we're seeing the end of this current monetary fiat system that's based on the US dollars, the global reserve currency. And the reason I say that is because I think for several decades, we were in the process of globalization and I think the U.S. largely benefited from its mm. status as the petrodollar and the global reserve currency, and they were able to export a lot of the inflation. And so we benefited and we were able to go kind of more into debt. And we became a country that um, that purchased a lot from other countries as opposed to being one of a manufacturing hub like we used to be. And I think that the next decade is going to be characterized by de-globalization. I think that countries are going to focus more on um, on, on their own, you know, uh, monetary reserves and how they can hedge this situation where treasuries are basically now, um, so inflated due to our money printing. And I think that people have lost trust in the U S dollar. And the only reason that it's been able to survive and it will survive for a a bit longer is because of the status of global reserve currency. Um, but I think places like China are, are making plans. I think Russia is making plans where we've already seen countries basically say that they'll accept, you know, commodities or, or gold, uh, you know, they're stocking up their reserves with things that aren't us dollars and treasuries. And so I wonder what the monetary system will look like. I think we're going to have another Bretton Woods. We might have a reset. And I think the U S has a competitive advantage if it makes the right decision when it comes to Bitcoin. I really do. Uh, a lot of the Bitcoin mining obviously moved here. Uh, I think, you know, our legislative, our policymakers and our legislative representatives, they need to become educated on Bitcoin mining, how it works, how it's advantageous, advantageous to energy grids, um, how it could really help us get out of this sort of debt spiral that we've created. Um, because otherwise, I don't think that we're going to remain a global, the number one global superpower. I think other countries are, are running for that. Um, and we've become so dependent on them for things that we once used to produce. We used to be a country that produced, and now we're a country that imports. Uh, so on a global scale, I just, I think that the next decade is going to be um, <laughs> tumultuous. And, and, you know, honestly, I have to say this before I learned about Bitcoin, I didn't have a lot of hope when I thought about the future. I, I saw this economy sort of, or the country ripping apart at the seams in terms of polarization and people blaming each other. And social media allows that to like fester and get really, really big and nasty. But really, it's just like mudslinging. And I, you know, you're in this bucket, I'm in this bucket, we have to hate each other, we're all in our own silos, we have echo chambers online that reinforce these, these aggressions. And I was like, what's going to fix this? And when I learned about Bitcoin, I felt like, if we can fix the money, and we can fix, you know, this system of just 
the, the few socializing all their losses and profiting and everybody else sort of feeling left behind and, and squeezed and like they can't afford something basic like a house for their kids. Um, if we can fix that, maybe we can start moving in the right direction because I do have hope. And I think hope is essential to the human experience. I think hope and progress, like we, we, want, we want to connect with one another. I think we are naturally good. And, and, I, and that's why I'm so passionate about Bitcoin. Like I want to do what I can to spread the message because I think that we need to take the power of the state out of money and we need to take corruption out of money. We need to like try to rework the system. And we have the opportunity right now to do that through technology. So why not take that opportunity? But we have to educate people. Otherwise, they're not going to get it or they're going to fight it. Right. Well, what do you think this all means for the American dream? Um, well, I you think, know yeah. No, I, I talk about that a lot because again, my family is representative of trying to obtain the American dream and feeling like the goalpost moves every single year. You know, just as my parents were finally able to afford a small townhouse in the suburbs of Chicago, they took out a mortgage. Um, my mom tried to start her, her own business, which was always a dream of hers. And the financial crisis hit and at, uh, at no fault of their own, they lost everything because everything went under and all of a sudden their mortgage was higher than the value of the home. And, uh, and there was no, no business and no jobs. And, that's really sad, you know, because again, the big guys got bailed out and they got checks written to them and nobody lost their jobs and the executives got their bonuses and everyone in government kept their jobs. And then the average person was left to suffer. And, and my parents, that, that situation impacted them for many, many years. They're still not fully recovered from that. And so for me, I think that something like Bitcoin represents a renaissance potentially for the American dream. This idea that once again, you know, it is the American dream espouses the idea that if you work hard, if you bring value and hard work and you're willing to put in the hours and you're a good person and you have that work ethic and perseverance, you can come from any background and you can make it and you can achieve your dreams. And I think that although that's still easier in the United States than maybe other places, it's certainly not as easy today as it was just a couple decades ago. It's not as easy for millennials or the generations that have come after them to afford the kind of house their parents could because real estate has become such an asset bubble and they can't afford the stocks that their parents could. Everything's getting more expensive. So, you know, how could anyone be surprised that they would look at, at something like Bitcoin or crypto at large as this chance to like equalize the playing field, to get in on something, to finally generate wealth or to finally have a say and maybe decouple some of the power from the people that made life harder for them. Uh, you know, I think that in a way, this whole ecosystem, this whole space and industry, it's a form of a revolution, like a populist revolution for young people who are using technology to say, I don't want to be left behind anymore. I want a seat at the table. I want to rework the system. I want, I want to say, and I want to be able to afford some things that my parents cut that I can't. Um, so I think that with Bitcoin, we do have the chance for a new American dream and a dream everywhere, an El Salvador dream, a, a dream in Zimbabwe, a dream in Afghanistan. And, and I, I really hope that we can, once we recover from this bear market, we can just continue our work to educate people so that they understand the potential that this offers. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I agree with everything you said there, and I'd love to read one of your tweets. Uh -huh. uh, cost of living, food, energy soaring, 60 to 60%, 40% portfolio decimated. Mortgage rates climbing, stocks busting, Bitcoin falling. We haven't seen the unemployment unemployment fallout. Millennials and youngers uh, have no faith in the system. It failed them. Bitcoin is the insurance and it's on sale. Uh, I'd love to talk about this faith uh, in terms of, I remember when I was in my 20s, uh, I kind of figured, okay, um, the monetary system, I didn't think about it at the time, but it kind of raised my, my, my time preference. But uh, I just kind of did figure... Uh, we're all going to figure this out, whether it's the elders or, or whoever, because we can't live like this forever. But I didn't always put a lot more thought into it. Even if I picked up an interesting textbook or read an interesting, what am I going to do? Uh, how, and, and there was no Bitcoin at the time. What yeah. is faith like out there in, in, in the institutions among some of the younger people? Is it, uh, is it bleak? Or are they really kind of anti the establishment? Yeah. And, you know, it's so interesting because I think that there is at large, no matter whether I've, people group people in just two buckets right now, right? It's like right or left, 
red or blue, that's it. There's really nothing in the middle. But when you kind of dig into, especially what young people are frustrated about on both sides, it kind of does funnel into this, this idea that there is corruption and that you cannot trust people. There's this sense that like, I'm someone else, like there's a co corporate greed. There's either corporate greed or state, you know, politician greed and everyone else kind of is left holding the bag and there's a few people at the very top and they're all in on everything together and they're holding hands and like profiting from everything and everybody else gets left behind. It's like Jeff Bezos and, you know, the people in the white house and everybody else it's us versus them. So there's this, I think there's a feeling no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on that things are sort of unfair or rigged. And me being a millennial, I have seen so many of my peers, again, on both sides of the political spectrum, just saying like, I, you know, I make a six figure salary and I can't like rent is 50% of my paycheck or, you know, I can't afford a house. I can't afford the down payment that my parents once could, um, you know, this is, this is getting more expensive. I can't plan to have kids. How am I ever going to afford to have kids? Oh my gosh, look at the cost of education. The problem is that they're identifying the problems, but they're not identifying the cause of the problems, mm -hmm. which Bitcoin sort of casts that spotlight. Once you start studying Bitcoin, Austrian economics, and the history of our financial system, it starts to shed light on why these problems exist. This idea that we have gone so far into debt. We did become the reserve currency and exported this inflation. And here's what happened to the working class. Here's what happening to ha happened to manufacturing. Here's what happened with mass production to companies that are too big to fail, the big banks, them being able to take on too much risk with things like the FDIC, uh, government spending, those packages, how much they cost, kicking the can down the road to future generations to pay the tab. There are reasons for the problems that people are identifying that they're not acknowledging or, and there's no one telling them. And like, I worked in corporate media. We didn't tell people this and this is what they actually really need to know so i mean i don't know if that answers your question but it's like i think that people are identifying that there's something that's just vastly unfair in the whole entire system and they're placing the blame in the wrong areas and they're also asking now i think there's this idea that like hand me free money like hand me, Wait. fix my problems by handing me some free helicopter money because I'm getting screwed by this and that. Well, handing you that money and the, the mechanism that created that money is at the root of these problems. So right. again, like education, like I'm really big on educating people because I was like all of them. I didn't get it as well. Yeah. So speaking of educating people, if you could orange pill anyone in the whole world, who would it be? in the whole world. Wow. Um, I mean, I just think it's really incumbent upon us in the Bitcoin space to orange pill anyone with influence. So I think that, you know, all these people that have these huge followings, whether they're politicians like AOC or uh, people in, you know, the White House or people like the Kardashians or celebrities, whatever it is, like, I think that the more people that you can talk to and have a thoughtful conversation based on what's important to them and what, you know, what their own background is and help them understand Bitcoin so that they can talk to their audiences. Like that's how we're going to get, you know, mass adoption, uh, because people listen to the people that they like and respect and admire and follow. Uh, and so I think, you know, there's not one person, I guess I would identify, I mean, sure, I guess, I guess anyone in the white house, maybe. Um, but I just think people with influence, the people in media, I try to, you know, inform people within the companies that I used to work for the next networks I used to work for. I would love for more media personalities to understand anchors, to understand Bitcoin, um, politicians, celebrities. I mean, I just think anyone with influence needs to understand it. Yeah. Do you have a favorite part of Bitcoin right now? Uh, maybe a uh, part of Bitcoin or some aspect of it that you, you would study, even if it wasn't to prepare for a show or anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I certainly am really excited about the lightning network and scaling that so that we can onboard a ton of merchants and big companies, because right now it's not at that level where that's really even possible. Um, and so I'm fascinated by the sort of the, the S curve, the adoption curve and how quickly it's growing, especially when you compare it to the internet in the nineties. Um, and so I, yeah, I just, I think that the lightning network is something that I'm really intrigued by and studying. And I have an episode coming out about mining because mining, I mean, it, it brings together so many fascinating aspects about energy. 
energy and electricity and different sources of power and resources and the economies that um, that surround those. And so I think that's fascinating as well, but requires another you know area of expertise because you start learning about everything from nuclear to uh, hydro to uh, how the elect- electricity grids work. And so that's that's a challenge as well. Yeah, well, there's lots of challenges ahead. Uh, I, my final question for you is, do you have to prepare differently or how do you prepare for the five minute interviews that you might do with those sort of that TV spots where you're a guest and uh, you're on like say a, a, a CNBC or a Fox business channel. It seems like that's a very different charged and sometimes even maybe antagonistic environment. <laughs> Sometimes it does feel like that. Sometimes you feel like the anchor just like is so smug and happy that Bitcoin is down, right? Um, How do I prepare? Uh, So I guess two notes on that. Number one, I just try to stay on top of all the headlines and everything that's happening so that I can, you know, make any points that are relevant to news developments. But number two, it's just, it's like with anything, whether you play a sport or you have a specific craft, like I've been doing this for 10 years and I started out really bad and I, and I couldn't go live very well. And I was nervous and stumbled over my words. And then I practiced and every single day I would have to go live multiple times a day on television stations. And I became sort of, um, you know, trained in simplifying a message or crystallizing points so that I get across whatever I think is the most important and salient uh, that 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 an, a very general audience understands. So I think for me, one of the reasons why maybe people have resonated with things that I say is I think about the audience that's listening that might be distracted and busy, and maybe they don't have a, a very, you know, vast amount of knowledge about Bitcoin or financial markets in general or anything. And I try to drive at the heart of something. And so I've touched on these points of like people feeling left behind these things that are very, you know, core and universal to our human experience that we all are suffering from and that Bitcoin's trying to fix or address. Because then no matter if you're a Bitcoin holder or a Bitcoin skeptic, you can at least resonate with some of the points that I'm making on this macro level of just how we function as a society today. Um, and so it just, you know, I hope that I, I do my part to at least spark a little bit of curiosity for people to start to learn about Bitcoin. Yeah, in terms of functioning as a society, I mean, I, everyone I meet, most of the people I meet are awesome, amazing people. Everyone's out there uh, doing good work and, and trying to do the best for their, their family and themselves. And, yeah. and yet uh, maybe just the institutions or the way things are built and predicated on our monetary system, it just doesn't seem like it's functioning well. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I can't tell you how much I, I've enjoyed this conversation. Uh, this has been really awesome. Uh, I'll definitely leave it to you for any parting words and, and to let people know where they can find you and, and your work and the Hard Money Show and Coin Stories. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate your time and I'm really active on Twitter. If you want to follow me, I'm at Nat Brunel. My podcast is called Coin Stories and really grateful uh, about how much the show has grown and the following. Uh, and then I have this new show called Hard Money, which is on uh, what's produced by Swan as well as Bitcoin Magazine. And that's a weekly show that comes out on Thursday. So just thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And if anyone has any questions, they can reach out to me on Twitter or on my website, TalkingBitcoin.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natalie. It's been so good. Thank dope. you.